I was recently talking with a friend at work about how fragile our society is because of how much we depend on various components of our uh, nations and actually the world's infrastructure. Grocery stores, for example, don't stock more than a few days worth of food. Gas stations only have so much fuel on hand. Electricity runs everything. And I haven't even talked about the internet yet. <laughs> uh, the internet is uh, something that uh, is increasingly a dependency on everything from you know, our connectivity for our phones, our finances, even even household appliances have some some connectivity with the uh, internet uh, these days. Uh, we all do banking, I'm sure, online. All of our finances are hooked to it. Many of us don't carry a whole lot of cash because we have quick access to it digitally. I don't know how many of you have gone to a store where some kind of credit card system is down and they have to scramble like writing things down. It's crazy. It becomes very difficult to just make a transaction to buy something without some of these fundamental uh, pieces of infrastructure functioning. So he and I went back and forth about this a little bit. And uh, as my friend stated, as members of this modern society, we are only six meals away from anarchy. <laughs> That's, and uh, I don't know where he picked this up, but uh, I have a feeling he's probably right. After six meals, people begin to really feel hunger. And when people really begin to feel hunger, they begin to panic. Being Christians who observe the Day of Atonement, we know what it's like to go just one day without food and water, and we know how much of an effect it has on us. And that's just 24 hours. You go two days without food, and think about how you would feel. You know, have a pretty good idea of how you would feel. Now think about how people in the world will react when they have gone two days without a meal, and they don't know where the next meal will come from. How will they feel? How will you feel? <laughs> I've got one word for it, and that is desperate. <laughs> people will feel desperate. And when people are in desperation, their mindset changes. Kind people can become brutal survivalists. What was eye-opening to me in this conversation with my friend was what he said after he made his comment about six meals away from anarchy. He said that his morals become very flexible when it comes to the survival of his family. He said this kind of tongue-in-cheek, but he was also quite serious. Uh, now, I consider this friend of mine to be <laughs> have, have some real integrity. I really trust him, uh, and I... Uh, I think he's, he's, he's an upright kind of guy. And to hear this, this person say that his morals become flexible, it was like, whoa. <laughs> I uh, really thought about how this guy and the way he feels would transfer over to the rest of the people that it, uh, we reside this, in this world with. To think that he's probably describing how many, many more people would also think in desperate circumstances was very chilling to me. And that's the world that we live in. People have an instinct to survive. And it doesn't take much for people to see that others may stand in the way of their own survival. And what happens when they become desperate? People's morals become flexible quote unquote. And we've seen examples in even recent history when rioting takes place and this anarchistic frame of mind sets in. You think of how things were in New Orleans uh, during Hurricane Katrina. And in that situation, there, there was a whole city that was inundated with flooding. People were desperate. And uh, not only that, but there... The rest of the nation was providing them with some support, some rescue. It was slow in getting there. There were difficulties, but there was rioting. There was violence. There were, stores were 
looted. And uh, things just fell sideways all over the place. And we can see this even, man, it doesn't even have to be a tragedy. You have a, a college football team win a game, <laughs> a big game, and there's rioting in the streets, uh, which doesn't make much sense. But uh, anyway, people's frame of mind changes in certain circumstances. How will it be, brethren, when times become as desperate as we know they will be as the time of Jesus Christ's return draws ever closer. We know how they will be. Times will be horrible. The Bible is very clear about that. The people that we know, that we share this world with, we won't recognize them. The survivalist frame of mind is human nature. I just want to make that clear. We all, but we all know what it leads to. The outcome is not pretty. We've seen examples. But let's see what the Bible says about this frame of mind. Uh, turn with me to Matthew 16, verses 25 through 27. Matthew 16, beginning in verse 25. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. The comments of Jesus Christ here direct us to, to the frame of mind that we need to have in desperate times. What did he say about those who have the survivalist frame of mind? The one that reacts with self-interest. They will lose their life. That's what he says. He who desires to save his life will lose it. Somehow, some way, even the strongest of survivals, survivors will eventually die if they aren't spiritually minded. And what will they actually gain in surviving? Nothing. Who does God reward? The ones who follow after him. The frame of mind that will actually benefit us is not that of the self-interested survivalists which is no surprise at all, because it is a carnal way of thinking and a carnal way of behaving. And that's contrary to the spiritual mind that we need to have. We are to have a spiritual frame of mind if we want to please God. If we have a frame of mind that puts our trust in God and stands up for his way of life, his virtues, his righteousness, his morals, and if our actions abide, then we will find life. We will also find the reward that comes with doing that good work also. We need to remember that being spiritually minded is where we need to focus if we want to find life, that eternal life that really matters. Now, we've been hearing and reading a lot these days about the progress of current events in the context of fulfilled biblical prophecy. That's scary stuff. It really is. Uh, knowing what we must, as a society, what must eventually happen in this world is very frightening. And it's extremely so after we see pieces, after peace, fill in the puzzle of prophecy. It's enough to trigger some of that very human survivalist instinct in our lives. We are human, after all. Uh, we do have that uh, instinct of survival. Now, knowing what we know now, how can we prepare for the hard times ahead? How can we do the preparation that we need to do? We have insight that the world just does not have. We have a huge advantage. 
What are we going to do with that? Now what is that question that I put as my sermonette title? We would be silly not to do something with the knowledge that we have. But what? What should we do? I'm not going to tell you what to do. There's no prescription of action that I can give you. Only you can choose what to do with the knowledge that you have, the resources that you have. But what I can tell you is what God expects us to do if we want to find life, if we want to please him, if we want his protection. What I can tell you is the frame of mind that we need to have that will guide our decisions. And that frame of mind is not the kind that places priority on saving flesh. What profit is it, to paraphrase Jesus Christ's words? Let's go to Psalm 34 and read verses 16 through 22. Psalm 34 and verse 16. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears. He delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards his bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. What do you think this says? What are we supposed to do if we want protection? We have this promise if we remain determined to live righteously. God will deliver us if our morals are not flexible. If our morals are aligned with God, we will be protected. If we choose to save our own life instead of put our trust in God, we forfeit his protection. In the hour of need, whose protection do we want? <laughs> I'm going to choose God's. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to follow this way of accomplishing that. Turn with me to Revelation 3, and I'd like to read verses 3, or Revelation 3, verses 10 through 12. Revelation 3 and verse 10. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. We see this reassurance as well. It's easy to feel vulnerable as a human and panic. But we have to remember that the way that we will find protection in the hour of our trial is by holding fast to what we have. What do we have? What do you have that nobody else in the world has? You have the knowledge of the truth. You have the understanding <laughs> with the mind of Christ about how to live in a way that pleases God. That is what you have. That is your advantage. And by living according to what you have, by holding on to that, we will be saved in the hour of trial. It's by staying close to God, by keeping his commandments and holding on to that with all your might, where we will find our, uh, our help. So then, with the turmoil that will unfurl in this world, now what? What should we do? It's simple. Think like a Christian. 
preparing for your future and the family of God. That's it. It starts here and here. I'm not saying that we can neglect our physical needs. I hope that's not something you're taking away. We, we cannot do that. We need food, we need shelter, we need heat, we need water, we need those things. God knows that we need those things. We can't just neglect that. However, our investment of our precious resources, our money, our time, our thoughts, they need to support our spiritual development first. That's where we will get our return. Going to Deuteronomy 29 and reading verses 15 through 20, we can find some true encouragement here. It's a statement that Moses is delivering to the nation of Israel. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong the days in the land which you cross over to the uh, the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses against uh, today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, that both you and your descendants may live. Oh, sorry. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. That is our choice. We choose life when we choose to obey. We can find hope and encouragement in these words. God provides us with a way to follow that he assures a desirable outcome. When we face the question, asking ourselves how to respond to the fearful circumstances in the world, our answer should be simple. Be spiritually minded, trust in God, obey his commandments, and go on living.